Hey everybody, my name is Chad Harms and I'm the pastor of Creekside Bible Church. I want to thank you for being with our church today, either in person or online. As you can tell, I'm not. I woke up feeling a little bit sick today. I, I won't go into my symptoms, but I'm not too bad. I just feel a little bit sick and I'm, frankly I've been around a lot of people uh, over the last few days and so I thought all of you would appreciate me uh, staying home and uh, being cautious for your sake. But I do think I have some really important words to turn your attention to in the book of John. And so I want to share those with you. I'm going to do this in one take, which you don't know this, but a lot of times when we're recording sermons like this, I start and stop again. It's like cheating, but uh, it's Sunday afternoon and church is going to start to not too long. And so I'm going to do this in one take, no second camera angles, just me talking to you in a camera. And so I hope that, uh, that you know, you'll, you'll be able to overcome this being different and you'll really join me in looking what I think is, is really important uh, in the book of John, as I said. You know, we've seen as we've moved through the book of John these incredible claims from Jesus about how he offers eternal life. He says that we can have eternal life through him. He says that we will never see death, something I talked about last week. And in the passage today, he says that people will never perish if we believe in him. And at the same time, this entire series that we're looking at, Signs, Speeches, and Spiked, is about how Jesus does and says things that are very difficult and frankly can make it hard for people to believe in him. I, I feel like this series has been, and I didn't mean for it to be this way, but I, I think it's just the way it's come out is like my, I will not water down Jesus like the rest of the American pastors or something like that. And I don't think that about the rest of the American pastors, but that's how it's felt as it's come out of my mouth. And, and as I think about that, like that combination, here's Jesus claiming that he has eternal life and here's all these difficult words that I've laid down, you know, very, very straightforward. I've laid it down in a very straightforward way and called it a dividing line and all of those things. And and so those two things are at odds, right? Like we want people, I want you to believe that Jesus is the savior that can give you eternal life. And at the same time, I'm presenting all of these difficult things about him. And Today we encounter another story where Jesus says some things and it produces this incredible spite. But here's what I think this story does for us that maybe the other stories uh, don't do as clearly. It provides us, I think, some, some incredible evidence and it points us to an evidence of Jesus being truly the one who can give us eternal life. And here's what I want you to hear this afternoon. You should believe in Jesus despite the spite. You should believe in Jesus despite the spite. And here's how this story begins in John 10, 22 through 24. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered that, there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. They're there at the festival of dedication, which is a celebration of when Judas Maccabeus cleansed the temple after it had been defiled by a Roman who made a sacrifice to a false god. This is the celebration that we know today as Hanukkah. And for the people living at Jesus' time, it's a celebration of really the last time that God miraculously redeemed, saved his people, the Israelites. And so I think there's some foreshadowing in that because, because if you look back and you say, wow, God really stepped up to save us in that story. And here is Jesus saying that he has come to save the people. He is the next way that God is going to miraculously redeem his people. And in this story, we see that they gather around him. And, and the language here suggests that maybe this is kind of a hostile environment. It's like they hemmed him in. And really, they, they're trying to force Jesus to give them an answer. And the answer they want is whether or not 
he is the Messiah. Now remember that one of the reasons John has written this book is to prove to us, to show us that Jesus is the Messiah. Now when we say Messiah, that's a reference to this long-awaited king that the Jewish people looked forward to. And this king was going to come and he was going to set things right for the Israelites first, but also for all people. And Jesus has been doing messianic style things, but these people are looking at him and they're pretty much demanding, it seems, an answer. Tell us plainly whether or not you are the Messiah or not. Jesus has already said in John 4, 26 that he is, but now it begs the question, will he tell these people plainly at their request? And the answer is, he's not going to. Listen to this. In John 10, 25 through 29, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now for me, this, you know, again, begs this question. And the question is, why doesn't he tell them plainly? And, and perhaps it's because their view of the Messiah was frankly wrong. They believed that the Messiah would come and, and he would become a king on earth, a physical king. He would overthrow the Roman people. And we've already seen in the book of John that they tried to force him into that after he miraculously fed them, uh, fed thousands with just a you know, a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And so maybe Jesus won't tell them plainly because, because he knows that they're looking for the wrong kind of Messiah. And in fact, Jesus often uses this term, the Son of Man, which was a messianic title, but it, but it was a term that didn't have the same baggage, if you will, as the word Messiah. And so we don't know exactly why Jesus won't tell them plainly, but there's one guess. But he does say, I've already told you. And, and the question is, how has he told them? And the answer is that he has told them through the miraculous works that he has done. Think about those miraculous works. We've studied our way through John. We're up to chapter 10. And we've seen these miraculous works at the hands of Jesus. He turned water into wine. He healed the royal official's son from a distance. He healed the paralytic by the pool. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children with a few loaves of bread and some fish. He walked on water. He healed the man born blind. Jesus looks at these people and he refuses to tell them plainly, I am the Messiah. But he says, I've already shown you that I am the Messiah. And I think this is the first reason that you should believe in Jesus, despite the spite that he produced, despite all of the difficult words, because his incredible works showed clearly, I believe, his incredible works showed clearly that he is the one who has come to save people, to set things right for people. Jesus' works tell us that he is the Messiah, that he is the prophet, the priest, and the king, that he is the one who can save. And despite all this, many don't believe. And Jesus says, that's because they aren't, they aren't my sheep. They aren't my sheep. And he says that, that um, believers in Jesus have salvation and I don't want you to skip over that middle part. He says that, that his Christians, his sons and daughters, his sheep will have eternal life and they shall never perish. Again, this is part of the reason that John is writing. He wants people to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, so that they may never perish perish. And he cloaks all of this in shepherd language. I don't want to go too deeply into that, but I think that's really important. He gives us this imagery of him being our shepherd, us being the sheep, and the way he cares for Christians is so important. But even more, and I talked about this a bit last week, this idea of never perishing is so important. Um, I mentioned uh, last week again that my son's preschool teacher had had died recently, and I went to the funeral uh, last week on Thursday night, and and I saw one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen in my life. I uh, I saw the the husband of of my son's preschool teacher standing in the front row while we sang a worship song with his hand 
lifted high, worshiping Jesus. A newly widowed man who now raises three uh, men, young men, on his own, and he was worshiping Jesus. And I said, well, how can he have the ability to do that? And some may say, well, it's just fake. He's just you know, blinded by Christianity. But I would submit to you, and I think he would too, that it's because he believes that Jesus came to die for our sins so that we may never have to perish, and that his wife, while she's left us here on this earth, like we won't see her anymore, she did not perish. She simply entered into eternity where she will live forever. This thought that we can have eternal life is is one of the greatest thoughts that we can imagine. I mean, that Jesus offered himself so that we may live forever. And, and it's part of the reason that I would just, I would just say to you, believe in Jesus despite the spite. Believe in Jesus despite the difficult teachings that led to the spite because there is nowhere else to turn for eternal life. The story continues in John 10, 30. Through 33, I and the Father are when, one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which one of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. The people ask for a clear declaration of Messiahship, but instead Jesus gives them more than he bargained for, than they bargained for. He says, He says, I and the Father are are one. I, I want to just make so clear that one of the, the crazy, great, amazing declarations of Christianity is that Jesus is God in human form, that he is both fully man and fully God, that he is the God of the universe, the creator of all, as we've said in, as we've moved through John, the creator of all, who has not created himself, that stepped down into his creation, and he did that in order to save people from sin and bring people back into a relationship with him and his heavenly father. And there's a lot of ways that Jesus demonstrates this oneness with God throughout the book, but these incredible, explicit declarations cannot be ignored. John 1.1, 1, 1, this is the author of John writing, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 8.58, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. And now here in John 10.39, I and the Father are one. Jesus is saying, I am God. The author of John is saying, Jesus is God. And we believe this incredible story that I've alluded to a couple of times already as Christians, that God stepped down into our midst in the person of Jesus. And I don't think that, that we can fully grasp or that we can believe that story in the right way until we come to terms with the idea that Jesus is God. The one who created us entered in again to our creation. He came down into his, sorry, his creation in order to save that which he created. This, this makes the story of Jesus so incredible to me. God came to earth to save you and me. And he did it by dying for our sins, paying the cost of, of hell as he hung on a cross. Now people today will debate whether Jesus is actually declaring himself God in these passages, but the first century people who were listening to Jesus, they they did not. They say it outright, you a mere man claim to be God. That's why they pick up rocks to kill him. And Jesus, I think he offers this this trick question like, I have shown you many good works from the Father. From which of these for which of these do you Stole me. He's like, are you killing me for my good works? I think it's a, a trick question. My kids love trick questions. Sometimes they don't get them totally right. They'll be like, what's my favorite color? Be like, oh, blue. And they're like, trick question. Uh, what's a pair? Trick question. And Jesus takes, uh, you know, this moment and he, as they're trying to kill him, he just kind of offers him a trick question. Like, well, why? What, what good work are you trying to? to kill me for. Again, it comes back to these incredible works that Jesus 
did while he walked the earth. He healed people and fed people and took care of people and brought people back from the dead. We'll see that in just a few weeks. So it doesn't make sense for the people to not believe in him. And it doesn't make sense for the people to want to kill him, even though he is making a claim that is hard for them to understand. And I would submit to you again, you should believe in Jesus despite the spite that he so frequently produced while he walked the earth. The story continues. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe in me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. For me, this is the most difficult part of the entire passage. It's one of the most difficult things that I think Jesus has said in the book of John up until this point. I mean, what does he mean when he says all of this stuff about God? He quotes from Psalm 82, 6, and frankly, it conjures up these ideas of Mormonism, the Latter-day Saint faith, where Mormons believe that, you know, as God is, man once was, and is. uh, man is God once was or something to that effect and is Jesus you know claiming that there's lots of gods and as you can probably guess uh, the answer to that is no Uh, we have to ask the question what is it that Psalm 82 6 and Psalm 82 as a whole is actually saying and and there's a bunch of ways that uh, Jewish Jewish uh, scribes and rabbis understood Psalm 82, and it's difficult to know exactly which one we should pick, but let me give you kind of four big options. They they think that maybe Psalm 82 is talking about angels, or or this guy named Melchizedek, or judges over Israel, like people who are put in charge of the Israelites, or Israel as a whole at Sinai. And uh, I didn't have time to dive into all of these, but let me tell you which one I think it is, and it seems to be the most popular choice. That is that Psalm 82 is about human judges that God has put into place over his people. People that are meant to give God's perspective and ruling on things that happen specifically for the Israelite people. And and some of these people are in the midst of the story that we're looking at today. There's lots of religious leaders, Pharisees and otherwise, hanging out with Jesus, questioning Jesus about whether or not he is the Messiah. And And so I think this is what Jesus is alluding to. And if that's the case, then uh, this one guy who just frankly wrote a comment on uh, on the internet, I think he does a great job of explaining what's going on here. His name's Tim Mass or Moss. uh, And I'm not quoting him because he's some kind of expert. I have no idea who he is, but I think he did a good job of getting to the heart of of the meaning here. He says, Jesus was quoting Psalm 82, 6, in which the psalmist wrote in verse 2 through 6, of God speaking to humanity and comparing the power he had given to humans to act as rulers over his creation, to administer and care for it, and to pass judgment in his name and on his behalf as making those humans, in that delegated earthly sense, gods. The psalm goes on to say that that none of these humans possess divine attributes and all of them will die. And so thus they are in no comparison to Jesus, who is an eternal being, who himself is God. But yet there is that title being given by God. They are gods in some lowercase sense, according to God. Now, I want to quote from John Piper here, because before you dive into all the theological nuances of this, you need to know that Jesus is not diving into the theology of Psalm 82. Here, listen to John Piper. And Jesus isn't going into any elaborate argument here about the meaning of this psalm. He's simply using the text as a shrewd escape maneuver from being about to be stoned. Jesus has already asked a trick question, and now he uses this kind of obscure, difficult psalm to make the people question their own, you know, theology and what they believe about this psalm. And so you ask the question, what is the point of all of this? And I'm going to another internet source here, but I actually think that catholic.com does a great job of explaining. It's one of the first things I found on Google when I was trying to figure out this myself. 
In the psalm, God is con- condemning the judges of Israel for their wicked judgments and reminding them that they will face him at the ultimate judgment. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is pointing out the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders in assuming the descriptor God but denying it to Jesus himself. His people are looking at themselves as gods. But now standing in the midst of the one who is and seeing the incredible work that he is doing, they're ready to kill him for his true and right declaration of divinity and oneness with his father. Some other blogs says, if scripture was not an heir in calling mortals gods, then neither is there heir in calling the one whom God consecrated and sent into the world the son of God. Of God. Jesus uses this, you know, the, the trick question and then this, you know, pointing to the scripture to say, look, <laughs> you yourselves, if some of you religious leaders, it's probably not the whole crowd, but you've taken on a godness in, in society. And yet you look at the one, the true God, who has come and demonstrated incredible works that prove that he is divine. And you want to kill him because of this claim. Now look, the easy part of this is Jesus saying, do not believe me unless I do the works of the Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. I mean, again, Jesus did such incredible things. And the reality is that it all points to the fact that you should believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, despite the spite and all of the things that he said and did that sometimes produced that spite. Now I know what you will think, but did Jesus actually do these things? I mean, is there any real proof that he did them? And I would submit to you, absolutely there is. You have to remember that the author of this book, the book of John that we are studying our way through, was an eyewitness testimony. This is an eyewitness testimony. He's giving an eyewitness account of what he saw Jesus do. And and all of the disciples are willing to testify to who Jesus is and what Jesus did, despite the fact that it would cost almost all of them their very lives. They died or at least were tortured because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, and they were running around the known world testifying to these incredible works. And on top of all of that, we have this this thing we call the Old Testament that pointed to these incredible works and the incredible work that Jesus would do on the cross and who he would be and where he was born and all of these amazing details about his life. And so I say to you that there is incredible proof of the reality of the works that are recorded for us in the Gospel of John and the other Gospels. And because of that, because of the proof of these works, I absolutely think that it is right and good to believe in Jesus for your salvation so that you never have to face death. You never have to see death. You will never perish I think it's right and good to believe in him for the salvation of sins, despite the spite that we see in this gospel. You should believe in Jesus despite the spite. But the story is not over. It says, Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. There was this man that we call John the Baptist. And John went out into the wilderness and he was baptizing people in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, in preparation for the coming of Jesus. And and people flocked to John. They believed that John was sent from God. They believed that John was a prophet. They believed that John was the one paving the way for the Messiah to come. And, And it's crazy because John looks at Jesus at the beginning of the book of John that we're studying is like, here is the lamb who has come to take away the sins of the world. He says, I'm not even worthy to untie this man's sandals. He also says in another place that he's needs Jesus to baptize him. And, and here there's some people at the end of our story who are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We believed, we believed 
that John was sent from God, that he was telling the truth, and he pointed to Jesus. And we believed in John even though he didn't do any of these incredible miracles. So why wouldn't we believe, why wouldn't we believe that Jesus truly is the Son of God who has come to save us? Now for some people out there, for some of you, I think, but the way this applies is that you believe a lot of what Scripture says. I mean, you like the good passages that promise that, you know, God loves you, that God wants what's good for you. You believe in things that are such Christian ideas that you don't even know are Christian ideas, that all people have value and worth, that, that no matter, you know, what gender you are, or what race you are, or, you know, how you live, your own beliefs even, you, you have value. God created you and you just, you know, because of that creation, people shouldn't be mean to you or hurtful to you. I mean, you, you pray and you believe that there's a God up there who is listening. And these are all things that come to us through the Bible. And, and these men that wrote the Bible for us as inspired by the as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, you believe them and they're saying, hey, Jesus said some really difficult and controversial things, but we want you to know that he is the savior of the world and you should place your belief in him so that you never have to perish, but you can live in eternal perfection forever. And I would say to you, if you believe all of the nice, good things of the Bible that so drive the best parts of our culture, why wouldn't you believe them? Why wouldn't you believe it, the Bible, when it says to you that Jesus is the only way for you to be forgiven for your sins, to enter into a relationship with God, and to live for eternity? You should believe in Jesus despite the spite. There's prophecy. There's John the Baptist. There's the amazing works that he did. There's the fact that there's nowhere else to turn. Eyewitness accounts. There's so many reasons. And what I think people so frequently do is they just think, sometimes rightly, I don't like everything that Jesus said, and sometimes wrongly because They've, they've heard people teach incorrect things about Jesus. They said there's certain parts of Jesus I don't like. And so there's this spite and they choose not to believe in him for the salvation of sins. But as we read this story, it begs the question, I mean, what side are you going to be on? There's these incredible claims of deity and, and you can be on the side that picks up stones to stone him, metaphorically speaking today. You could be on the side that says, man, look at the works. Look at the testimony of others. It sure seems that he is telling the truth and you can believe despite the spite. For those of you that aren't Christians, I invite you today, I ask you today to choose to believe in Jesus despite the spite and to give your life to him. And for those of you that aren't, sorry, for those of you that are Christians, I just ask that you stop being embarrassed, being embarrassed about the difficult things that Jesus said you start to remember how incredible it is to believe in him for eternal life.